Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace. This is a show where we take one topic and we break it up into a number of different segments so everybody, myself included, can understand it a bit better. And this week we are talking about God. That's right, the big G-O-D. We're going to talk about how science and God are not opposed, but they're actually in harmony. How we came to believe in God in the first place, or reject God. We're also going to talk about the origin of religion. We're going to go all in on this one. It's going to be pretty fun. But first, we want to talk a little bit about who believes in God and whether science says there even is one. There are scientists who believe in God. Scientists like Gerhard Ertel, who is the winner of the 2007 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. He said in an interview that same year in the German political magazine Cicero, I read the Bible very often and I try to understand it. But he also said the creation story is, of course, a parable. He balances his faith and his work by saying things like, to him, life is a huge miracle. Asking why are we here and how did we get here, that's where his belief in God comes in. Francis Collins is another scientist who believes in God. He's the director of the National Institutes of Health, and he's been there since 2009. He is an evangelical Christian. In 2007, Collins said, As a believer, I see DNA, the information molecule of all living things, as God's language, and the elegance and complexity of our own bodies and the rest of nature as a reflection of God's plan. He was the former director of the Human Genome Project, so when he talks about DNA, he knows what he's talking about. It's pretty neat. But these are people's faiths, and they aren't in contrast with their scientific beliefs. They're in Congress with it. They're in harmony with it. Although they embrace religious faith, scientists can also embrace science as it has been done for centuries. These scientists are looking at the natural world and they're looking for expectations for how things work around them. That's what science is for. And they recognize that scientific ideas must be capable of being overturned and evidence and experimentation and observation are going to change science over time. And ancient scientists did this too. But there's room for God in all of this stuff for these people. But, you know, we'll, we'll come back to that. You can clearly study how the world works and not prove or disprove God. If you're saying that science has a way to disprove God, you're wrong. If you're saying that science has a way to prove God, you're also wrong. The subject of God is often thought to be a taboo subject for a lot of scientists. There's a lot of politics involved in science, and there's a lot of politics involved in religion, and the two don't always get along. But to go back to Francis Collins for a second, he was an atheist, and when his parents died, he was looking for a little more meaning in his life, and he found evangelical Christianity. He claims that the subject of God and religion in the science world shouldn't be taboo, and he often speaks freely about his Christian faith, and we shouldn't disparage him for that. That's his personal choice, and as long as your work doesn't get in the way of your life and your life doesn't get in the way of your work, why would anybody care what it is that he believes? According to a study in 2005, two-thirds of all scientists believe in God. Social sciences were slightly more likely to believe in God than natural sciences. Natural scientists like physicists, chemists, biologists, 38% of them said that they didn't believe in God. 31% of social scientists said that they didn't believe in God. And that's psychologists, economists, anthropologists, political scientists, and so on. As I said, there is no scientific proof that God exists or does not exist. There's no way you can prove that. I mean, can you prove or disprove black holes? Mathematically, sure, but we can't see them. We don't have a picture of one. We don't have a picture of God either. What about the origin of life, or you know, what happened before the Big Bang, or why the universe is even here, or if there's alien life out there, and how it got put on a planet, or how it came up on a planet? All of those things leave room for faith. There are things that science cannot explain. They're, I would hesitate to call them miracles, but they are miracles to some people. Science cannot explain what is outside of our universe, right? Our universe lives inside of a bubble of radiation called the CMB, Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. It's a wave of electromagnetism that was created by the Big Bang and reverberates at the furthest reaches of space. What's on the other side of that? Another universe, maybe? I don't know. Like the outside of our snow globe? The nucleus of an atom in the thumbnail of a giant? Heaven? Nobody knows. So one guess is as good as any other guess, really, because it is just a guess and we can't prove it. And science can't explain where life originated either. We know that life probably originated in a primordial soup and we ended up having something happen that created life. 
But Eric Metaxas wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal exploring science's proof of the existence of God, explaining it like this. We are at the right distance from the sun so that temperatures are conducive to life on our planet. We have the right atmospheric pressure for liquid water on the surface of our planet. We have the right ingredients for life here on our planet, the right heavy elements, the right organic molecules, all in the right place at the right time. We have the right amount of water. We have, you know, all of these different things that are perfectly balanced to give way for life. And then on top of that, the life became intelligent. <laughs> That's pretty rare and it's pretty unlikely. And in his view, perhaps God intervened. He's not entirely wrong. All of those things are incredibly unlikely, though as we discover more about planets and as we discover more about our universe, what was once unknowable will be knowable. We can't scientifically prove that he is wrong or right and that God didn't, you know, flip some kind of switch to turn life on. But for me, at least, we can, over time, show more and more of the picture of this, more and more of life's origin until God lives just in a little bubble of coincidence at the end of what we know now. And we don't want God to be a switch flipper, right? That's not a safe, secure place to leave our faith. There's more to it than that. God could work on another level that we can't even understand. So even with all of science's methods and abilities of experimentation and observation, we won't be able to know what God is anyway. And that's fine. God could work on another level that we don't even understand. Even with the scientific method and all of our observation and experimentation, there might not be a way for us to test whether or not God is a thing, or at least not in the foreseeable future. I mean, something that we talked about when I was younger, when I was in high schools with some of my teachers who I was on the level where you could talk about religion with your teachers at school, we talked about who's to say the universe wasn't created in six days, but that a day for God is not a day for man, right? Six days doesn't mean six rising and set of the sun on earth. It could mean any number of different things. We don't know. You don't have to read religious texts as literal interpretations based on our point of view. The Bible has a whole lot more digestible material when you read it as an abstract explanation with metaphor and parable. The leader of Christian science, not Scientology, mind you, Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, wrote in the religion's textbook, Science and Health, with key to the scriptures, that when reading the Bible, the reader should take the inspired word of the Bible and not a literal translation of the text. God doesn't have to be a person. It doesn't have to be a thing. It doesn't have to be a man or a woman or a spirit. God can be unexplainable. It can be anything and nothing. And that is okay because God doesn't have to be any one thing because religion is very personal. So God could exist if you decided that God exists. On top of all that, God could not exist at all. And that's also fine. We could be making all of this up and trying to figure out something that's not even a question. It's not even a problem. You know, it's not up to me to decide for you whether or not God exists or doesn't exist and vice versa. But this is a question that people have, and it's something that science has looked at, and it's looked at it for the whole history of this field. But for some reason, we ignore it. Why? I know this is a sensitive subject, but, you know, why do people shy away from discussing this, especially openly and honestly? Do you believe in God? Do you not believe in God? Tell me about it down in the comments and express why. Try to not attack each other. Come on, we have a pretty good community here on Test Tube Plus. Tomorrow, come back to find out all about how some of the scientists who don't believe in God feel and why. And subscribe for more Test Tube Plus so you get all of our videos every single day. And if you can't wait until tomorrow's episode, you can go back and watch last week's episodes all about languages and where they came from. They were awesome. I hope you liked those as well. We delved into it pretty deep. Thanks for watching.